merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter suffering and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, Great 
perfect power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth poured its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back the sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be 
to God. We know what sin is, breaking the Ten Commandments. But we also know that no sin is any greater or any worse than any other in the eyes of the Lord. All sin results in the death of the one who transgresses what the Lord commands. This should not shock us to hear this. How many of you have ever been to a doctor? Of course, all of us have. The fact that we need medicine reveals that we have been born with a sin-tainted human nature. It is because we have all sinned in thought, word, and deed that each one of us will one day face the grave. Death has always been the result of sin. However, not all who sin will be punished with eternity in hell. For those who hear Jesus' word of the law, repent, <coughs> believe in him, and are baptized, their sins are forgiven. Their place in heaven is assured. The resurrection of the dead is theirs. So while our sins condemn us, they also resulted in Christ's death to redeem us by atoning for our sins by shedding his own flesh and precious blood for us. Because of Jesus' perfect, obedient life, his sacrifice, his descent into hell, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven where he sits at God's right hand, no great millstone will drown the repentant person's soul. Rather, in the waters of holy baptism, which is washed over us, our sins are drowned forever in Christ. And yet, Jesus makes it clear. There are dire consequences for those who sin without remorse and who are unrepentant. He also makes it abundantly clear that the church, and especially those who are parents, teachers, and leaders in the church, have a huge responsibility to protect the little ones in our midst. And the little ones are everyone from the tiniest baby to the most aged, gray-haired saint sitting in the pews or stuck at home. And how are we to do this? Protect the little ones. By not leading them astray. By not causing them to sin because of our actions. And by making sure that we teach them the truths of the Bible so they know that what sin is but even more importantly, we also have a responsibility to point our children and all who will be truly Christian to Jesus alone as their only Savior and Redeemer. And we are called to do this so that they know who Jesus is and what he has done in saving them from their sins. Teaching them that they have been justified, declared righteous on account of Christ, and not in their own good works, as so many false teachers believe and teach. Rather, teaching correctly the truth of the Holy Scriptures. These little ones and all who hear join us in living repentant, God-pleasing lives and are not led astray then by the passions of the flesh, selfish desires, or are influenced by the ungodly culture and the world around us. You see, without knowing the Word of God, we would be Easy to pray for the devil, who St. Peter says is like a prowling lion. And even knowing the word of God, it is easy for us to be led into temptation. And that's why we come to hear and receive the Holy Spirit through the word that is preached. It is for our good. So that we, who are the little ones of God, will not be led astray, but will walk with the Lord. That's why Jesus is harsh here. Because he knows it is false teaching which can ultimately lead to unbelief and even damnation in hell itself. Many don't like to talk about hell any longer. They pretend perhaps that it's gone away, but it hasn't. See, with his words, Jesus wants us to learn what it means to follow him, to be one of his little ones. But we might ask, why does Jesus then lift off and list off all those ways we're to mutilate our bodies? Unfortunately, this
this has led some to believe that we are to punish ourselves when we sin, as if that will atone for our errors and disobedience. But Jesus says, cut off your hand, cut off your foot, get out your, get out, out your eye. Does he really expect us to do those things? Well, yes. Perhaps not literally, but in a very real way nonetheless. After all, if we were to cut off every part of our body which causes us to sin, every one of us would be blind, deaf, and mute, crippled, unable to walk, talk, or touch. In fact, from what we heard a few weeks ago, we would even have to cut out our hearts. Because the heart is the source of all kinds of evil, passions, lusts, desires that are contrary to God's word. And yet, Jesus tells us these things because sin is very serious. And so he uses extreme examples because he wants us to take our sins very seriously as well. Because the consequence of not removing the things that cause you to sin can result in eternal damnation, hell itself. For if you love the things of this world which cause you to sin more than you love the word of the Lord which warns you to turn away from that sin, then you are showing your unbelief and your desire to serve yourself rather than your heavenly Father who created you, gave you life, and blessed you with salvation itself through his son Jesus. Remember the first commandment, which have no other gods. What does that mean? That we should fear, love, and trust in God alone. For there is no other God except the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, in his desire to help us realize this, Jesus describes the way our flesh tempts us to sin. And so he starts with our hands. If your hand causes you to steal, then do not go where your hand can take what does not belong to it. If your hand causes you to sin because you can't keep it to yourself, because you're too busy grabbing your girlfriend or your boyfriend, then don't get too close. Even the work of our hands can cause us to sin when it keeps us from serving the Lord. If we become too greedy or too lazy to help our neighbor or love them as ourselves, or when our work or our leisure time becomes so important to us that we don't bother to come to church anymore, hear God's word. Of course, Jesus also warns us not to commit sin with our feet. Our feet take us to the wrong side of the tracks, to the wrong people, tempted to purchase things that might harm our bodies, which our Lord, in fact, has given us as temples of the Holy Spirit to use for His glory and to serve our neighbor. It would be better for us to be laid up and helpless, dependent on others. And even our healthy bodies and strong legs with Feet that are fast and backs that are strong can lead us astray if we trust our own strength rather than call upon the Lord for our help and comfort. If that is your temptation, then it would be better for you to be weak and sick, trusting in the Lord. Jesus also warns us that our eyes can lead us to commit sins. For us men, the temptation to look upon women who are not our wives with lust has led to many broken marriages. And even for women, the temptation to break the sixth commandment may be strong, thinking it will bring security or simply enjoying the excitement of being desired. But if that's not your temptation, what about our eyes which lead us to sin because of coveting something that someone else has, and yet we do not? Or how about those eyes which cause us to quickly judge others by how they're dressed or how they keep house or how they raise their children? Our Lord's warnings cannot be ignored. All these temptations when given into can lead others astray or even cause them to sin right along with us. And the consequence of not avoiding these sins in our own lives and in the lives of others cannot be underestimated. For the consequence of not recognizing our sin, no matter how teeny we think it might be, and for not repenting of the things that we do against our Lord and against our neighbor, well, in fact, we must <coughs> For hell is a real place. A place described by our Lord as a place of torment and suffering, a place cut off from all that is good and right and comforting. For hell is a place in which the mercy of God does not touch. Therefore, this is no child's play, these words of our Lord. 
And this again is why our Lord word warns us so sternly not to lead others astray. Because our sins really do offend God. Sins really do incur His wrath, and many will suffer the consequences of their sin in this life with maimed relationships and even crippled bodies. But even more disastrous is the thought of eternity in hell. Our sins are so offensive to God, He did something drastic in response. Offended and angered, and yet ultimately loving and merciful, God the Father sent His only begotten Son to die for our disobedience. And in His mercy, because we are so often led into temptation, our Lord has given us His word to cling to, His promises of forgiveness and salvation, given to us in holy baptism and received at the sacrament of the altar and the preaching of the gospel into our ears. So that us poor sinners who are still his Christian people will not suffer the punishment of hell. How sad that, that even with these blessings, the desires of the flesh is often go back to the old ways of sin. Just as the people of Israel were longing for their old ways and the cold comfort of their bondage in Egypt, thinking, well, at least we have meat to eat. People desired the wheat, garlic, and fish of Egypt. How quickly they had forgotten that was a time of bondage, not freedom. Even the old Adam in us often desires the flesh pots of Egypt rather than the breast blessed bread of life. The people of God then despised manna. Many of us despise the preaching of the word and don't gladly hear or learn it. You see, the devil is so good at deceiving us, he makes our old sins seem good and even desirable. And we, who hate to admit our guilt or even our wrongdoing, often cling to those old sins because they're comfortable for us. And we even enjoy them. But again, thanks be to God. Just as the Lord rescued his people from Egypt, your Lord has rescued you from your sins. And believing this, we, our response is to strive to live according to the word of God and God's will, rather than to the desires of our own flesh, no matter how enticing they might seem. After all, it is often painful to give up a sin that we enjoy doing. It can be just as scary and painful as the thought of cutting off the limb or maiming ourselves. That's true of our spiritual condition. But this time, it's not necessary to take a knife to our flesh. Instead, it's the sharp, two-edged sword of the Word of God which does the work on your flesh and on your spirit. Applying His Word to our lives, the Lord cuts open our hearts so that His Word of the law will do its work of laying us open to the cleansing, scouring salt of His gospel, which again makes us clean. Just as we heard Jesus teach through the law, with the law we examine ourselves. We see our sickness revealed. But the law can never save us. The law doesn't bring healing. The law doesn't comfort. Certainly it shows us our need, and it's good. But the medicine you need is the gospel. The only medicine for sin which proves true, provides true healing is the promise of Jesus that he will never leave nor forsake us. That God loves us with an everlasting love. That our Lord so loved the world that he gave his, himself up for it. And by his stripes we're healed. That he has purchased us from the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his own precious body and innocent blood. You see, these promises are the medicine your soul needs so that you will not be led astray, but instead comforted, healed, and resisting temptation to sin. And these are the truths which we must clearly teach the little ones who believe in Jesus, even our children. These are the words that we live by so as not to be led astray by false teachers who point us to our own good works. And we declare there is no such thing as God. Just as the Apostle James taught my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back from his water will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You see, through the preaching of the gospel, you have been brought back. Through the intercession of the Holy Spirit praying for you, you have received eternal life. Your sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. So we pray for others as well. 
we intercede, we preach the law and the gospel, because it is the truth of God's word rightly divided. For it is Christ's blood and not ours, which has been shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And for that we rejoice. His was the body that was maimed and wounded for us. He is the one who has not led us astray, but rather is the good shepherd that has led us to eternal life in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You have been watching the Divine Service at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Carlisle, Iowa. Join us this coming Sunday at the Divine Service, which begins at 9 a.m. Our Divine Service is followed by Adult Bible Study and Sunday School at 10.30. You're also invited to join us for Vespers and Catechesis for the entire family on Wednesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. We also gather for the morning prayer service of Matins on Thursday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Holy Cross is a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and is located at 1100 Market Street, Carlisle, Iowa.